So a special meeting was announced on the day we were we sent off our distributor milestone for national fuel testing. This was likely the first version that had mostly stable, complete characters with some fatalities. It's probably the version that's out in the wild right now. At that meeting on December 5th, 1996, our project was officially cancelled. Checking the dates, it's apparent that the decision was made long before the milestone had been seen, so that meant we pretty much never had a chance. This is Primal Rage 2, officially unreleased and unofficially re-released. For a long time, the gaming community thought that Primal Rage 2 had been lost in the sands of time. That is, until dumps of the ROM started showing up in the 2000s. But why was the game never released? And was it just a simple feat of emulation that is playable now? The answers to these questions might be more complicated than you think. If you're familiar with Primal Rage or you've seen my other video about Primal Rage, then you'd have a pretty good idea that it was much bigger than just a game. The franchise became a legacy for many of us and remains so today. It had a full marketing push with everything from toys to comic books to novels, an expanded universe, and a fan base that was eagerly awaiting the sequel, which never showed up. Without guys like Dennis Harper, the senior producer and programmer of Primal Rage, and his team at Atari, the game may have never existed. But I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's back up a little bit and talk about Chris Tang. Because a big part of the Primal Rage 2 story kind of starts with him. Chris Tang, whose role in Primal Rage 2 was as a designer and gameplay strategist, poured his heart into character design, gameplay mechanics, and overall balance, helping to shape the distinctive features that were planned for the sequel. Tang's focus was on expanding the complexity and strategic depth of the game, including the development of the human avatar characters who would channel the powers of the original beasts. This introduced a new layer of gameplay which made Primal Rage 2 more advanced than its predecessor and would have offered something that no other game was offering at that time. At GDC in 2018, Chris Tang spoke for over an hour about Primal Rage 2. He talked about his passion for the game and how it wasn't just the setting that made Primal Rage stand out. It was the dark humor, the originality, and of course, the brutal brain-eating fatalities that brought a twisted satisfaction to players. And then goes on to discuss the core concept, the innovative element that would make it stand out and potentially be a huge success. Blizzard and Chaos were by far the most played characters. Even in Killer Instinct, which is another 1994 fighting game, Less humanoid characters like Riptor and Saberwolf were the least picked despite them being powerful. Fighting game players just preferred characters that could hit with their arms and legs instead of biting or using their tail. Since our game was practically all beasts, what could be done to make a successful sequel with, with Primal Rage brand? And the solution was kind of strange. Da, 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 da. So I recount the day when Dennis, our producer, ran into my cube and proclaimed that he figured out the solution. <laughs> You'll never believe what I've figured out. I have finally figured out the key to success with Primal Rage 2. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's Dino Morphin time. At first I was like, what? Is this gonna work? But I ended up loving the idea. Mighty Morphin Power Rage. The idea was to have Titan sized human avatars that could morph into a beast form and back. Players could hit the top row of buttons, which would morph the character into beast mode, performing a flashy auto combo sequence and morph back. Players could also pick a beast character that could conversely morph into their human form. Experts could also pick a third meta version that could morph at will but didn't auto combo. This dynamic would make it so that the game was accessible to beginners with the easy super moves for the normal versions, but it'd still be deep for experts who could do man manual combos with the advanced one. Accessing Memory Archives 1976 Atari's first death and loss of founder, Nolan Bushnell 
Atari's origin story reads a bit like the tech industry's first soap opera. It was as quick and epic of a rise as it was a fall. After the wild success of Pong, Atari began to struggle in the console department, which was perhaps the catalyst for the somewhat volatile downward spiral that Atari took from there. With the Atari 2600 considered a failure, in 1976 they sold the company to Time Warner Communications. In 84, Warner split the brand and sold the consumer division to Jack Trammell, the computer industry's famously combative knight errant, who rebranded his own company, Trammell Technology, as Atari Corporation. Meanwhile, Warner retained their arcade division, which they cunningly rebranded as Atari Games. As if things weren't tangled enough, Atari Games was sold to Namco, which then passed it along to WMS Industries in 1996. With WMS being a subsidiary of Midway, it makes you wonder, were they hoping the coin-ops division would fail? And did they ultimately kill the company to kill competition? After this, there was a blur of unsuccessful product launches, handoffs, and lawsuits until Hasbro bought up Atari rights in the year 2000. Thus began the game of corporate hot potato. Until in 2009, Infro Games bought Atari, rebranding itself as Atari SA. Since 2009, WB Games ultimately owns the rights to the arcade titles. A fun fact, Slash Fang's avatar, his full name is actually Zhao Ming Tang Quan, which happened as a result of the team being unable to agree on a name. It's a mashup of all the Asian core team members. And while the intent was borderline racist, the situation was hilarious and everybody liked it. Moon me, moon. Moon, moon me? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's Dennis, our producer, posing in the main hallway to the Rage Lab. And on the right, a poseable wire puppet mold pole for Slash Fang that I used to design his moves. The game was initially for formally initiated as a project on March 1st, 1995, with a budget of $2.3 million. $2.3 million dollars which for a game in that era was a very large sum it's mind-blowing to think that they were able to get a 2.3 million dollar budget for this game especially considering the fact that atari was undergoing significant changes that were heavily going to impact the fate of its sequel on top of that animation delays a bad beta and hardware migration from the awful kojag hardware to the zn1 zn1 pcbs are essentially first generation playstations with a faster processor what made this zn1 particularly special was that they were using a hard drive for a storage medium but just when it seemed like things were finally getting situated that's when tragedy really struck at some point i was told to dial it back to wait to hear back from management just in case things went south but being young and stubborn, I did not, and secretly worked late into the night and didn't care if I was told not to. I wanted to see our game become the best it could be because I envisioned players around the world having a blast with it. This is the point of the story where it actually starts getting emotional for me, seeing a team and someone like Chris talking about his experience and his passion for the game and the disappointment that came after all the work and heart that was put into its success. Dennis Harper has also openly expressed his feelings about the situation and that he's, well, less than happy about the way that things turned out. If you want answers, like most things in the gaming and media industry, follow the money. Why on earth, I wonder, uh, would they not at Midway not have somehow pushed this thing through to completion, I wonder, to release? Well, I can tell you why. Um, okay. When they, when they were bought by Midway, they looked at this game, and then they said, well, this looks way too much like Mortal Kombat. So we don't want to compete with against, you know, ourselves, basically. But essentially what they ended up doing was cannibalizing their own franchise anyways, which is strange. A $2.3 million project and a wildly successful brand and franchise. So they threw away gold to protect gold. If anything, this speaks very highly of the game, that they were that threatened by it or the Mortal Kombat franchise was that threatened by it. But let me pose another almost more sinister theory, which may in fact be taking us into the realm of conspiracy theory. KI2 was being developed around the same time as Primal Rage 2, and considering its connections to Midway and Rare, and the fact that some of the devs from the project went over to Rare, would it be too far of a stretch to think that they may have misappropriated some of the character and level design from PR2? For now, take a look at these characters and some of their moves. Do you notice any similarities? Too 
Looking at the character names, Tusk and Arik, both four-letter names end with K, although Arik's name has a much higher meaning than Tusk's does. They essentially represent the same idea. As for the character themselves, Tusk appears to be an inverted Arik, where he's holding his sword the same way, but he appears to be oriented in a different direction. And it's pretty hard to deny the other similarities in their outfit. Then we have the curious case of these three girls, Maya, Kina, and Melissa. Another shared similarity between Maya and Melissa is that both of their level designs are jungle designs. They both have a matriarchal look, and if you take away the L and the S's in Melissa, you end up with Maya. All of their names end with A's, and their outfits share similar design as well. Maya and Kina both have a weapon in or attached to each hand. And Maya and Melissa both have anklets, bracelets, leg attachments, and a crown type deal. Could this be another reason or the whole reason why Primal Rage 2 was dumped? The reason why the company was willing to throw away a $2.3 million project? It would have been very difficult to produce a straight to home conversion of the game. Consoles of the time could barely pull off an accept acceptable Primal Rage 1, and it wouldn't be until a decade later with the PlayStation 3's hard drive installs that a proper Primal Rage 2 could be made. With the time I had left, I kept working hard and polished things up to the very end. I didn't know any other way of operating, and I'm not even sure if I went home. I remember the last day when we were all in the lab, and I was hammering on things until the last second, and my last, my last batch of edits almost didn't get in. Sometime in the mid-2000s, out of curiosity, I did a random web search to see if anything on Primal Rage 2 had ever surfaced, hoping to find something along the lines of emulation progress, but I didn't find what I expected. This is how I found out about a website called DeviantArt, and what would later be come to known as Rule 34. Apparently, there were fans of Primal Rage 2 out there, and oddly, fan art and fan fiction of it existed, particularly of the female character. An era of emulated arcade games began, and while most of them would become playable on computers through emulation, Primal Rage 2 did not. With its special custom hardware and unorthodox graphics delivery methods, that made sense. But later, I found out from one of the programmers that they had booby-trapped the code to prevent bootlegging and reverse engineering. The lack of emulation meant that it would remain unplayed by the public, sealing its fate to be forgotten. Presumably, this was done out of spite and to protect their work. They probably didn't want other companies stealing it and reselling it. Then the unimaginable happened. In 2017, Primal Rage 2 finally became playable through emulation. Long-time efforts being made by YouTube user Gruntzilla94. Slick like oil, got the hacks on the rage. In this game of digital chess, he the king. Ripping through the rage, mainframe, hit a car, she brain. Gruntzilla Titan, another emulation game. Ripping commas, hard and JK, bring the heat. And in March of 2017, he released a modified version of MAME called MAME for Rage 2 that allows existing Primal Rage 2 ROMs out in the wild to be playable. In some ways, the emulated game runs better than the actual hardware as loading data within emulation is faster than that of a 1996 IDE hard drive interface that we didn't get to optimize, <laughs> leading to better frame rates and more consistent animation. This was big news for anybody who was a Primal Rage fan and who was on the emulation scene at that time. Gruntzilla doing the work of the emulation gods. Playing it for the first time really was a treat. I'm completely floored. The prototype arcade machine appeared at California Extreme, a retro arcade show here in the Bay Area in the early 2000s, but either the buttons or monitor didn't work, and that made me super sad. When I saw this, as either an act of information charity, or maybe like leaving flowers on a grave, I left a Primal Rage 2 official move list that I had made for the distributors and duct taped it to the cabinet. Pictures of this flyer would circulate on the internet thereafter, adding to the game's mystique. This is a message from one of my friends who's a pretty big collector in the coin op scene. He states that from his information, there are four known boards. Ray Dude here on YouTube has one of them, and he posted this 11 years ago. There's kind of a lot of mystery surrounding this guy because I don't really know who he is, but apparently he had this thing in storage for 14 years. And if he still has it, he has now owned it for 25 years. Two years after posting this video, he did respond to somebody in the comments. So 
presumably he still owns this board, or at least it's not the one that went to the galloping ghost. After reading his video description, it looks like he could have possibly been involved in the development of the game. And speaking of the galloping ghost, they didn't post their first PR2 video until 10 years ago, which means that most likely this is a different board. While they all have similar features, being a ZN1, there's a few important considerations. But more importantly, when comparing Ray Dude's board and Galloping Ghost board, they look like different boards. And the harness is slightly different. And then you have Cool Fox's build, which is now owned by someone else. But when looking at his, again, the board and hard drive setup appears to be slightly different than the other two that we've already seen. And again, remember Ray Dude's comment was two years after he posted his initial video 11 years ago. Galloping Ghost posted their video 10 years ago. We can definitely account for GG and Cool Fox's build and take an educated guess that Ray Dude still has his, or at least it was a different proto board. So the only thing that that leaves us with is the California Gaming Expo prototype. But if this isn't Ray Dudes, then that would be the fourth one. Visually restored original moves list, link in description. And now I wonder to this day if the final lab version is out there somewhere waiting to be discovered. What? What the fuck? <laughs> Even though I was very loyal to Atari games as a core ideal, it wasn't really the same company anymore. Not after WMS had taken over. But the real payoff and what really healed me as a game developer after having their dreams canceled so long ago was getting to see players play the game and enjoy it. I am glad that Chris was able to find closure. This is one of those things that can permanently break somebody. As far as Primal Rage 2 goes, it was a huge missed opportunity, in my opinion, for Warner Brothers games. I mean, the entire franchise was, really. And while I am super grateful that people like Gruntzilla are out there making games like this playable, I'd also love to see some vindication for these developers that worked on this game. And a kind of ultimate closure. WB, Atari, if you guys ever see this, please do something with this franchise. And let's rage again. If you believe in vindication for these games, devs, and our community, leave this hashtag down below with your comment and let me know what you think. And Dennis, if you see this, thanks for reaching out. It really helped me and it changed the direction of this video dramatically. Thanks for watching, stay safe, and I'll see you soon.